I think that we actually want to see each other succeed, not only in our engineering endeavors, but also in our careers. And I suspect part of the reason why that's the case is because we understand success in your career gives lift to the entire community. Welcome to the LabVIEW experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. Little bit. Uh, and he's off doing stuff with DMC right now. We'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. And uh, yeah, I think that's enough of an introduction. So why don't we start by talking about your time at NI? Yeah. Uh, first off, thanks for letting me be here. It's, it's always an honor and I appreciate it. So, uh, Chris Cholino, I actually spent the opening chapters of my career. I, I wrote that career at National Instruments. It's about 11 years. The first two, two and a half years, I was an applications engineer. And it was in that role that I gained a, a real sense of customer service uh, and empathy, putting myself in my, my customer's shoes so that we got them a really good solution. I love that time. I went from there into R&D, where uh, this is where I kind of really got my professional software engineering uh, and software development education, all centered around LabVIEW, which is the language I love. So I'm a LabVIEW champion. Uh, I was joke with people while I was in R&D. I owned the DAC assistant. I didn't create it. I owned it. <laughs> and uh, all the good stuff in the DAC assistant, that's me. All the bugs, it's somebody else. I wrote my fair share of bugs. Uh, I learned so much in the DAC assistant, it was insane. Um, and I have people to think, thank like Reed Lee for that. He was my tech lead while I was there. Big shout out to Reed Lee. Uh, I decided um, that I really enjoyed, though, communicating. Uh, I loved teaching people about LabVIEW. And what I enjoyed teaching, what I enjoyed communicating was information that made their lives easier. So if I could teach them how to do something in LabVIEW, cool. But if I could pair that together with a task they were trying to accomplish in LabVIEW, that's what knocked it out of the park for me. And my first experience with that was when I was invited by the marketing team to go and give a presentation on just how do you code in LabVIEW? And I still remember this. Um, we were in a hotel setting and there were, I don't know, maybe a hundred people sitting around tables. And before the presentation even began, I started talking with one of them and uh, they were asking questions like, how do you, I want to do the same thing over and over again. I just feel like I'm copying code. I said, well, have you heard of a while loop or a for loop or a repeating structure? It was like, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out. Yeah. And what I realized as engineers, as, as folks uh, who have um, experience, we actually know more than we realize. And that puts us in a fantastic position to help other people. And helping other people, incredibly rewarding. So this, uh, this presentation where I was invited to for marketing, I got up there and I started talking about uh, queued message handlers and producer-consumer and how you can pass information from one loop to another loop by this queue. And I was just having a great time. And the marketing team walked up afterwards and said, Chris, what are you doing in, in R&D? You should join sales. And I was like, uh, I don't know about all that. <laughs> so it turns out, though, uh, I really do enjoy communicating. I decided to pivot my career from doing uh, development only, which was super rewarding, into talking about what we could do with LabVIEW and talking about how it's influenced the world. And that's a, a fantastic story. I love sharing. It would take an hour to share it. But... All that to say, that's where I discovered I can talk. <laughs> and I think this is something that most engineers uh, either wrestle with or they're just unsure of. Well, I used the marketing um, venture as an experiment, which I think we're going to be talking about yep. a little bit. Thankfully, this wasn't one that failed, but I didn't know that at the time. Uh, anyways, so I uh, did um, marketing for about two years, had a great time, decided I wanted to get a little bit more technical again. And then I went to Cirrus Logic. That's where I spent three years of my career. Uh, I got to serve, say, 40 to 50 validation engineers who had been rewriting test suites and validation algorithms each time a new product or one of our products would rev. Now, they try and reuse the code, 
But what they brought me on for was to help improve the efficiency of reusable code so that they tweaked as little as possible and got maximum flexibility in the code. Oh, fantastic. Now, the way I viewed this was, I'm saving these people time and effort in rewriting code because that's not really what they're trying to do. They're trying to validate a product. If, if they have to rewrite code um, a bunch, then that's what they wind up doing instead of doing the end goal. So let's minimize tool creation, minimize uh, tool editing, maximize engineering output. And I got to do that for three years. Absolutely awesome. Worked with some incredibly talented people. Had an incredible boss. Big shout out to Dan Kimmett. I, I think the world of him, uh, he set a very high bar, no doubt. This notion of helping other people. I got to do that for, like I said, 40 or 50 people. And I found, I want to do that more. In fact, I want to do that on a global scale. One of the biggest challenges that we solved at Cirrus Logic was how to make reusable packets of code and then distribute them. And when they're distributed, make edits, check that back into source code control, and then redistribute. So this is the notion of collaboration and distribution of code. It's like, why don't we have a global repository or something like that for package management at, 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 inside the LabVIEW community? That would really benefit us all so that we could actually find and use each other's code so we could work on code together. Let's, let's do that. And so I started Googling around a little bit and I happened on uh, PyPy.org, P-Y-P-I.org, mm -hmm. and it is the global package index for all packages uh, relating to Python. Python is a super powerful uh, ecosystem. I've evaluated the language a little bit. I think it's, it's, it's an okay language. Nothing's going to be ever as good as LabVIEW, in my opinion. I think the real power of Python is in the proliferation of these modules that can just do what you need them to do right out of the box, whether it's writing to a cell in Excel or printing out a PDF. You can just go download the module. So the real strength in the language is its ecosystem. I want that for LabVIEW. I want us to be efficient so that we minimize tool creation and maximize engineering. And the way that we can minimize tool creation is if all of us can create the tool once or maybe twice and edit it, then nobody's starting from scratch. And then we can actually do really cool stuff like finding cures for cancer or uh, participating in humanity's journey to the stars because that's what's engaging. That's what's incredible. So that was the birth of G-Central. Uh, G Central's whole entire purpose uh, is to enable the LabVIEW community to make the best version of itself by removing barriers to collaboration. And while it started off with this notion of one package management system to rule them all, we had three package managers at that time, VI package manager, NI package manager, G package manager. Uh, and by far and large for code distribution, VI package manager is the way to go. And um, my hat's off to JKI with VIPM.io now. It is the global repository. As an individual, I can make a package and upload it. This is all for free. Yeah, once it's uploaded, now anybody, Sam, you can get your hands on whatever it is that I distribute simply from the VI Package Manager interface, which is awesome. Now we can find and use each other's code. We're not going to have to code from scratch. Thumbs up. So did that complete G Central's mission initially? But we, we've got um, a whole lot more on the horizon because we want to remove all barriers to collaboration. It's not just the idea of an individual creating code. What if I don't have the opportunity or the time to create the code? I just know that something needs to get done. So uh, my hat's off to the folks in, on our board of directors and the volunteers that we have at G Central. They came up with the idea of the G Idea Exchange. And this is what our next initiative looks like. We have a, a couple of different initiatives. Think of the GID exchange as um, the, the merging together of Kickstarter plus LabVIEW ID exchange. So now anybody in the community can come up with an idea and form a, kind of a, a Kickstarter um, uh, funding, or crowdfunding, that's, that's what I'm looking for, a crowdfunding um, campaign. And once a certain amount of money is raised for that idea, all sourced from the community, then G Central will take that money and go hire somebody to implement it. And the implementation is owned by the community, lock, stock, and barrel. 
So G Central is still removing barriers to collaboration by bringing tools into existence through fundraising and hiring. So that, that's going on right now. So that's G Central. Totally thrilled about that. And in parallel, this is after I left Cirrus Logic, doing G Central. And in parallel, I decided, you know what? This consulting thing, I think that I'm interested in doing that. Uh, and I, I dipped my toe in it with Compose Systems, a great bunch of guys. Then I decided, I think I want to try this on my own. And I birthed my own company, mm -hmm. Petrin Way, which was a fantastic experiment <laughs> that I've actually recently, uh, about three or four months ago, decided to close down. Because about four or five months into my, uh, my, my own venture through Petrin Way, I came into contact with a, a brilliant guy, Jesse Batchy from DMC. And he and I started talking about what it might look like for me to join DMC and bring my passions, uh, my consulting experience to bear underneath the DMC umbrella. Uh, and it has been exceptionally rewarding. I've, I've really enjoyed working with the folks at DMC. The projects that we get to do, phenomenal. About three, two, three months ago, uh, I think I got the chance to announce on LinkedIn that DMC was awarded a contract from Northrop Grumman to do the test systems for the NASA Space Launch System Booster Obsolescence Life Extension Program. And that's a mouthful of acronyms. That's <laughs> S-L-S-B-O-L-E. Excuse me, BOLE. Now, that's a cool project, but the reason why it's so inspiring and so interesting and captivating to me is those that, that work participates in humanity's journey. We're affecting individuals and people on a continual basis in a meaningful way. That, that gives me a sense of purpose. It makes me want to wake up every day and go to my job because I get to have an impact on people. I love how much I get to do, who I get to impact, and who I get to work with. There's a lot of get-tos in my life, and I'm very, very thankful for it. So that is a brief summary of my career. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was like whirlwind tour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I could dive into any one of those and talk about it a fair amount. Well, I'm curious. So you talked about G Central eliminating some of the barriers to collaboration. What are some of the other barriers that you see? Oh, man. So I think that the barriers are, oh, man. So we could talk about barriers in actual infrastructure systems that we have in place. Like how do we do continuous development? How do I, as a, as a contributor, write code in such a way and then have that code packaged and disseminated. Well, it turns out that delivery, it's non-trivial. So I think that there are some really great ways, there's some good systems in place that uh, could grease those gears. That's one barrier to collaboration. Another one, I'm still convinced, it's a, how do I, how do I find everybody's code? Well, I can go to a VI package manager and you know, I can type in a, a package, but what happens if the code hasn't been packaged yet? What if it's just in a, um, an open source repository like GitHub or, um, yeah. or, or GitLab. How do I find people's open source repositories? One of G Central's initiatives is to actually start indexing and putting together a list of all the open source repositories. So I, as a community contributor can go find work in progress and go contribute to it. And then the owner can disseminate it through continuous distribution. Another barrier to collaboration is how, what are the actual mechanisms by which I contribute to your code? What does it mean to branch? What does it mean to pull and merge? And how do I do graphical diffing? How do I, what does a good community commit look like in somebody else's repo? There's all kinds of, I think, best practices that we can start to disseminate. And so I think the primary barrier to um, collaboration there is education and knowing what it means to be a good citizen, and then how to use the tools at our disposal uh, for things like get commits, yep, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of, I think, room for improvement there. One of my biggest challenges was uh, the lab new versioning issue oh, man. because uh, I wanted to contribute to Cori at one point, and I pulled down the source code. Okay, I can look at it, but it was written in LabVIEW 2013, and like I didn't have LabVIEW 2013. So right around, it's like, do I really want to spend an hour setting up a virtual machine just to contribute to this? And it's like, yeah. Well, I think that you just hit on something big to begin with. You understood the concept of a virtual machine and sandbox. Yeah. Right? And that's a whole entire lesson. People don't need that. Yeah. People need to learn those things. It, it It's critical. Um, one of LabVIEW's strengths and simultaneous weaknesses is the version code. 
uh, and that there's there's some tools that are in place like VMware or VirtualBox or one of the virtualization technologies out there that can eliminate the pain, but it comes with the overhead. So, well, that's part of the problem with software development in general is that there's a lot of ancillary tools that you need to learn how to use. And particularly, you mentioned CI/CD. That is huge, massive. Because like you got to learn some sort of scripting, either PowerShell or Git Bash or something. You got to learn all kinds of networking stuff to make sure everything can talk to each other. That's right. Yeah, you got to learn YAML and all these other... I'll yeah, the, the networking thing, as you just said, one of the one of the critical parts, you might build a package on your build machine, by the way, have a build machine that isn't your development machine. Yeah. How do you programmatically get that package off of your build machine onto a network? You're going to need to understand how to do things like net use and make sure that you've got permissions to distribute to... That's just your lo local internal network. Yeah. All, all kind, yeah, there's a million little Lego uh, bricks in yeah. the whole entire project. And it's quite frustrating in CICD when it fails oh, because man. it could be any one of the Lego bricks and like you're like, you just go through one at a time. You're like, is this thing doing what's supposed to this thing? That's right. And like, yeah, it's... This actually begs an even uh, bigger point. Creating the tool CICD, thumbs up if you can get it to work. When it goes down, it's a pain because there's so many small pieces. Yeah. When you make your tooling, it's important to put logging in place, yeah. some sort of a breadcrumb that you can follow so that you don't, you minimize the amount of time going through all the different Lego yeah. blocks if possible. Fab and Jorg, I think, refer to that as debug-driven design. Debug -driven. That's a great term. I love Particularly that. for CICD because there ain't, there aren't many breadcrumbs there. No. And huh, that assumes that you've gotten, bit, well, I guess build is a part of CI and CD. Yeah. Build itself, I always tell people, build is as, if not more complicated than the thing you are actually trying to build. It's a complicated process, especially if you're using dependent PPLs inside of LabVIEW, oh. or if you have multiple targets, how you compile for maybe multiple OSs. It's a challenging problem to solve. Yeah, PPLs definitely go down that rabbit hole because you got to build them all in the right order and figure that out and like... Oh, there's a bunch of tools for that, but big shout out to Phil Joffrain, who's just gotten through releasing a tool to help determine that build order for PPL. Is that Jovian Arts? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah, the like GitHub Jovian Arts. Yes, yes. Uh, what is he called? The Labu Builder or something? I forget. I what believe he, that's he might have changed his name. Yeah, I wish I had remembered the name, but at DMC, we're, we're yeah. making heavy use of it. Yeah, MGI had a tool, but the MGI tool was kind of difficult to use. I mean, it had some... View. Yeah. Yeah. So the MGI tool was more designed to take a look at build specifications you already had set up and then just build them in the order that you specify. Yep. Which means you, you have to go right order yeah. build. Well, with uh, what Phil Joffrain has done, he programmatically determines the right order of build and at build time swaps from the link to, yeah. the, to the PPF, yep. which that's worth its weight in gold. No, yeah, that's definitely a good way to do it. Right? But it sounds way better. Yeah, because... Yeah, the MGI one, you have to set all that up yourself, and you have to figure it out. And, you, and if it changes, and then you're you gotta go in and figure out how. That's to change correct. It. Yeah. yeah, it's painful. very painful. Yeah. Uh. Part of my interruption, but I thought now would be a good time to let you know that Sam is hosting a CICD course on November thirtieth of twenty twenty three. So just like they mentioned. Setting up CI/CD can be very daunting, but it doesn't need to be. Sam made it super easy with this course. He's going to walk you through the whole process. You'll set up your own GitLab runner and connect it to a server. You will walk out with a template project that will run on your machine. You'll just copy and paste a few files and change some variables, and then you will be able to set up a fully working CIC pipeline for any project within a few minutes. Go to the link in our show notes to sign up and learn more. Okay, I'll let you get back to the podcast. Maybe that will cause people to adopt PPLs more. I don't know. I, I've kind of avoided them, but... Uh... There are some significant advantages, especially if you're using code outside of LabVIEW, yep. like in test end, yep. if you need to export code. This. I forgot how we got onto this train of thought. Wow. I know, but I, I think that's... PPLs are an interesting one, though, because I think... You need to know what problem you're trying to solve when you when you use these new technologies and stuff, right? Because that, that like people just get distracted by shiny things. Like everybody's talking about PPLs, so I'll just go turn my whole project into PPLs. And it's like, what is the problem that they're solving with PPLs, and what what problems do PPLs solve, and do you have those problems? Golly, what a fantastic question! Um, oh, I could talk about this for a good long while. Don't let me talk about this more than two minutes, Dean. <laughs> so what you just talked about was the new shiny tool uh, and learning how to do a thing. Okay, great. Um, but 
do you really need it? Do you need what it does? Which means you have to understand the why. Why, yeah. Right? It all goes back to why. Um, interfaces were released just recently. And every, that was all the rage. And, and, and I get it. Although I was trying to figure out, how am I going to use this? And I just recently found a really compelling case for me in my line of work. That having been said, interfaces, they are certainly worth understanding, researching, and applying. Um, but if you just jump onto interfaces because everybody else is, it, the, the ROI, return on investment, I just don't know what's going to be there for you. Well, I got a great story about that. So when I first started at Westinghouse, I, I inherited this circuit board tester and had global variables everywhere. Uh -huh. And I went away to uh, LabVIEW Core 1 and I came back and they tell you, you know, avoid global variables, use functional global variables. And I tried to explain it to this other guy who was working on the project. And I, I understood why you wanted to make the switch. That's right. But he did not. And I did a poor job of explaining it to him. And so he took and replaced every single global variable with an FGV that just had a set and a get. Oh, my God. And that was it. And I was like, wow. I was like, you just made our code more complicated and did absolutely zero to solve the problem. <laughs> That's all of the pain with none of the benefit. All right. Yeah. It was, I was like, wow. I was like, I, yeah. Oh, so, go on. Yeah. Dude. So, but it was easy to swap them out. So, it was, yeah. But poor yeah, food. that was like, yeah. Poor food. Because in order to actually eliminate the race condition, you actually have to change the code a little bit. So true that. Yeah. You asked me about the Labview Champions. Yes, actually, yeah, we didn't talk about that. Let me circle back there. Real quick. Um, for anybody in the community who's unaware of what the Labview Champions program is, um, the 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 notion of Labview Champion is a status that was mm, a designation created by National Instruments to recognize and identify uh, people in the community who have a, a broad set of experience across the NI tool chain, but specifically Labview. Uh, those who are passionate about LabVIEW, who want to see it adopted um, and continue to evolve into an even better tool than it is today. Um, I oftentimes refer to myself as one of the crazy people who think that LabVIEW should be the only language on the planet. It's not true. LabVIEW has its strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, but I, uh, I got the chance to take over that program during my time in marketing, and I found it to be an incredibly rewarding experience because I got to work with the who's who in the LabVIEW community um, I got to bounce ideas off of them and really learn from them. Uh, and then I got to hand that program off to Nancy Henson, who's done a, a bang up job with it. And uh, now Eric Reffitt uh, is over it. He's doing an incredible job as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're the crazy people, about 150 of us in the world, uh, who want to see LabVIEW's adoption proliferate everywhere. And I, I could talk about why I think LabVIEW is as awesome as it is. That's a whole entire other spiel into itself. But I found the LabVIEW Champions program to be so rewarding because of, again, this idea of service. Uh, we get to help grow a tool set used by scientists and engineers to affect radical change in the world. I just, it's, it's hard for me to imagine something for me that's more rewarding than yeah. that. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I think that in my mind, the thing that makes LabVIEW great is the community, oh, yeah. which is like, it, it's much better than any of the other programming languages I've tried to it's fantastic. play around with. Great examples of our community. So we have uh, the community forums on NI.com. Um, we have the Lava community. We have VI Package, uh, VI Package Manager and all the VI packages that are out there. We have events like NI Connect and what used to be NI Week. We have this incredible <laughs> GDevCon, right? So, which you found it. Yeah. Uh, well, not North, North America. Help part of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't do all of it. Yeah. So, I love that initiative. There is no substitute for face to face interactions. Now, clearly, there's that you can go to a presentation where you're sitting and watching somebody present, and that's useful. Don't get me wrong. But there's no substitution for after the after party. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just bouncing ideas off of each other over barbecue or over a beer. And it's like, oh, did you know that interfaces can blah, 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 blah? Or, uh, did you know that you can do, this is, this is one of my favorite little things. Did you know you can do conditional indexing on the output of a for loop or a while loop so that you only build an array of the elements that you care about? There's a little option there. Yeah. Little, little tidbits of knowledge that you can learn. And that's just, that's syntax, but there's also grandiose architecting ideas. We start talking about solid design principles. We can really start to dive in. What does single responsibility mean? How have you... How's that influenced your coding? Those are the kinds of conversations we get to have at events like GDEFCON. 
So I think it's awesome. Yeah, I think those conversations are really important because I think part of the reason that LabVIEW has such a good community is because we're all learning because most of us are not computer scientists or computer engineers. Right? Yeah. And we're generous with our knowledge. It's not just like we're learning and then hoarding it. I think that we actually want to see each other succeed, not only in our engineering endeavors, but also in our careers. And I suspect part of the reason why that's the case is because we understand success in your career gives lift to the entire community. I think that the hope is as you discover, as you grow, uh, as you are helped by the community, then you give back. And I think that we're seeing that. Uh, lots of people contribute in lots of different ways, and that's really encouraging. Huge shout out to the all the, the, the multiple boards of directors and yeah. the um, uh, multiple nonprofit organizations that we have. That's people volunteering their time and talent. Uh, nobody's getting paid for that. Yeah, It's because we love it and because we find great reward in helping out. It's, we have a fantastic community. Yeah. Well, I, I found it interesting when I applied for the Champions Program many years ago. They give a list of like different ways that you can contribute. I don't know if you, you probably put that list together. There's like 20 things on that list. Do you really like? Why? Well, yeah. Do you remember any of them? What's What's one of your two or three favorite ways to contribute? My favorite ways to contribute. Uh, well, I like the podcast. I like GDefCon. Uh, I like giving presentations. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And th there are so many benefits to contribution. One of the things that I found as I present that reinforces my learning. Mm -hmm. One, uh, if I can clearly convey uh, an idea to somebody, I get to help them. That's rewarding. And there's the somewhat selfish, I'll volunteer. It's a little bit selfish. It's, it's, it's awareness. Yeah. My name gets out yeah. there. So all, everybody wins. Yeah. Everybody the pre wins. presenting is really good because you have to simplify what you learn and that, that's it, right? Like, cause like you learn all this stuff and putting it all together into a coherent package and coming up with a coherent, like my mind, like. There's all these different design philosophies out there and trying to put into coherent packages your design philosophy of how you write code and, and the processes you use, I think is really interesting. Well said. Yeah. Well said. I, I think that's the stage where we get more into the art versus the science, where the science is like, how do you do a for loop? Wh how do cues work? But then there's the, how do you choose an architecture? What's your design philosophy? Yeah. What are your goals? What, what, what do you value, right? Like, for example, if you look at Actor Framework and DQMH, right? They're, they're two frameworks that solve the same problem, but they have a very different set of values. That's correct. Right? Actor Framework values things being very independent and being able to spawn off all of them and being able to add a, a new actor that does one tiny little different thing. That's right. DQMH, its emphasis is on debug-driven development. It's uh, accessible to beginners, right? So yep. depending on what your goals are, you could yep. tackle the same problem in either one, but one's probably more suited. That's right. I think that a lot of that is dependent on the individual user, uh, the individual person's experience, and like you said, the values. One of the the choices I made when I was at Cirrus Logic, um, I, I had to actually select what type of implementation methodology would we use to put this framework into place. Do I go DQMH? Do I go Actor Framework? Do we do something else? And though I could have understood and used either DQMH or Actor Framework, I had to consider everybody else. Right. So um, I selected the code and the framework that would be accessible to everybody who could contribute to it in a meaningful and efficient way. Yeah. That's part of the value. It's just what's important in your application and who is going to be working on it, not just what and how it does it. Yeah. Yeah. I think like the reason that like Actor Framework works well for some people is because they're working in a situation where everybody who works there knows Actor Framework and that, that, that seems to work fine. Yeah, but yeah, there, and there are there are differentiators between the two. There's strengths and weaknesses, I think, to both. Like you said, you just you got to figure out who and and what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, I think that goes to like trying to solve the bigger problem, right? Like, you, you and I were talking earlier about like consultants and how people come to you and uh, you know they come to you with this symptom. That's correct. Because they're really they're really very much aware of the symptom. They're like, this hurts. That's right. But no, but they're not the doctor. They don't know exactly what's going on underneath. Correct. And so, yeah. And that was actually one of the reasons why I decided to do my own consultant business, in which you are a consultant now. One of the cool things that we get to do, we get to see beyond the symptom. We get to see the root cause of the problem. And then we can suggest and consult on how to solve the problem so that the symptom is alleviated. And hopefully that symptom, we put ourselves in our client's shoes. 
this is where I love the agile user story. Um, the form of it is as a, a persona, as a technician, as an operator, as a, who, as a manager, I need a feature, whatever that feature is, so that I can... Yeah, it's got to be connected to something tangible, right? It's like That's nobody correct. just wants a log on button. That's correct. Yeah. Right? Or, or they might say, I want to log on. Why? What, yeah, what does that mean? Help me understand what that's going to do. Well, I need to log on because I need my credentials to be to fall into like a category of administrator or just a user. And that way we can edit how the UI behaves and as a result, simplify the UI where it makes sense, depending on who's trying to operate. That's perfect. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Or, or maybe they need that for an audit trail or something, right? Which is a totally exactly. different use case. Totally different use case. Here's another one. Oftentimes, uh, we'll have clients come to me and they'll say, I want all the data. That's gonna, we can do that. We can record everything that's going on in the system, lock, stock, and barrel. What decision are you going to try and make with that data? If they go, uh, I don't know, it's just going to be kind of helpful to maybe have. Like, We can do that. It's going to cost resources, but let me suggest, if, if we need to make trade-offs between things like hard drive space and maybe rate of writing, we need to keep costs down there. Let's figure out what decisions you're going to make based on the data and make sure that that's the data that we get. And then we can talk about cost for gathering all the data. Yeah. So the primary question is the why. Yeah. Why do you need the data? What decision are you planning on making? So yeah, I just ran into this with a customer the other day. They have an old test system and it spits out these CSV files and they wanted to load them into a database. And they were going to make one record for each data point. Right. And I was like, what are you going to do? With well, we're going to query the whole waveform. I'm like... Well, then store the whole waveform. It's like a, a, yeah. That's correct. Because like, you don't want to sort through a huge table. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And as consultants, we get to do that. We get to come in with this years of experience uh, and bring that years of experience to bear on our problem and suggest hopefully a good solution. So that's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to be able to do that. And I think the most rewarding part from our perspective is we get to participate in their story of doing amazing things. Yeah. Our clients do incredible things. Just incredible. At DMC, we've got the chance to do just mind-boggling stuff. And I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's really cool. And the other great thing about being a consultant is you get to participate in many different things as opposed that's to true. like if you're a captive employee, like that's great and that's cool, but like you only get to work on one thing. Like yep. you have some captive employees work on the same project for 20 years. Yep. But it also brings up an interesting point though. In the software world, I think part of the problem that we have problems with maintainability is people hop around so much. Uh -huh. Because if you work on a project for only like two years, right? You start a project, you kick it off the ground, you work on it for two years, and then you disappear. That's right. You don't learn how to write very maintainable code because you never have to maintain it. That's correct. And you just disappear. So yep. That's good. So this is the idea of bearing the, the individual bearing the consequences of the decisions they made in the code. Yeah. That lends itself to maintainability. Uh I think that after you inherit enough code and you see other people's choices and yeah. you suffer for their choices, I think that it helps an individual express empathy for those who come after them. Yeah. And, and, and realize the person who comes after them might be themselves two yeah. years later. So it's like, do yourself a favor and, and have a long-term vision for the code. Realize that's going to cost some money up front, but I promise you it pays dividends in the long term. So that's the choice to do it. But then to your point, how do you make maintainable code? And there's some good practices, I think, that you, that you follow. We can talk about that for a whole entire CLA session. Yeah, I, I think too, though, with that, dealing with legacy code, I think the empathy goes both ways, right? So when you're writing code, you want to have empathy for the person who comes after you. But when you're inheriting legacy code, it's also been good to have some empathy for the people who come before you because right, like, there's a reason that they didn't do things the way that you would do it. And part of it might be that those tools didn't exist or they like, you know, isn't that they, they want to have the training that you do or experience or whatever. So like they're, they're doing the best that they can with what they have at the time. What and great, it, you know, yeah, that's such a great point. And that's a lesson that I continue to learn as I inherit other people's codes. Yeah. My, my knee jerk reaction is why did they do they it that way? Why did they do it this way? Didn't they realize that? Yeah. And obviously that, they didn't usually that's or, right. Or maybe, or maybe they did realize it, but like they didn't have time. They were under pressure. Okay, great. So yeah, one of the, I think, biggest challenges to engineering in general is resource constraint. It, we can do lots of really cool stuff, but do we have the time and money to do it? When you bring time and money into the engineering solution, oftentimes that involves compromise. And you have to figure out what's the most efficient way to get a something done good enough 
today and in the long term. And so it, oftentimes the code's not perfect. Oftentimes there's hard-coded constants out there because they just had to do it that way. That's, that I would call that the benefit of the doubt perspective. Uh, there are other times when people just get lazy. Yeah. And that that's a problem. Don't be lazy. Yeah. Don't be lazy. <laughs> but also, too, there is like this idea that software is malleable, right? So like you don't want to do necessarily too much premature optimization and stuff. So I think that's part right. of it is finding the balance of like, okay, I have to make this decision now. If I take this shortcut, how much harder is it going to be to change it later? And sometimes I take the shortcut. If it's really easy to change it later, I'm like, you know what? Yes, this should probably go in an INI file, but I'm just going to hard code it right now. Look, I can add to the INI file later really easily if we need it. And so I just do that. And like, you know, should I do that? I don't know. But it's like, it's this pragmatic, like in the moment, like. I love that. Yeah. I think that makes great sense. Um, I've off, I used to be of the notion, you have to write an abstraction layer for everything. <laughs> It's a terrible idea. Now you definitely you need abstraction layers. Don't yeah, yeah, they they have their place. Yes, they're like salt, right? Every dish needs a little bit of salt. That's correct. If you put too much this. salt, nobody will eat it. <laughs> You're absolutely right. right. Yeah. Oh, I remember Stephen Loftus Mercer once saying, "If you create an abstraction around a singular instance, your gun, your your abstraction is wrong because you've only abstracted for one uh, instance of it. Yeah, you have to have multiple." instances that you're abstracting around so that you know that top layer is flexible enough. Now, to your point, do you use an abstraction? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Just get, get the code out there first because it might not need to change ever. Yeah. Well, it also might not be the right thing. Like that's that's my whole thing with the agile thing, right? It's about getting code Love to your customers. Agile. So like you don't necessarily want to hand the perfect code. That's correct. Right? Because they're going to give you feedback and you're going to change it. That's right. So so it just needs to be good enough to demonstrate the concept and make sure that you're on the right concept. Love and it. once you've got the concept right, then you can work on polishing the code and making it all nice and neat and and yeah. super well designed. There are all there are typically two modes of operation that I would say consultants in general operate in: either fixed bid or time and expenses. Uh, and both of them have their advantages and disadvantages depending on what your client needs. For large opportunities that are typically uh, government oriented, there's a fixed budget. Uh, or um, for whatever reason, a company says, I need to know, I need to bound the cost. When that occurs, um, the way that we as consultants make sure that we meet that cost is if we know what needs to be done. Now, the, the, the advantage to it is we bound the cost thumbs up. The disadvantage is it puts a heavy burden on the client to know what's, what are, what's the list of things that need to be done. And mid-course, if we need to make a course correction, we can do that, but it, it falls outside of scope and we're going to have to talk about change orders. That's the disadvantage uh, to fixed bid. Advantage to um, time and expense. Well, another oh. disadvantage to, so I really want to talk about that because yeah. this is a really uh, it's thing. Big. And you mentioned Composed and John McBee put me onto some stuff here so we'll yeah. talk about that. Yeah. But the other disadvantage to fixed price is that if you're competitive bidding people underbid all the time. Knowingly underbid and then immediately hit them with change orders. That's a really good point. That that definitely happened. That definitely happened. Right? So that, that, that's a, um, a question. Business. Yes, it, it is a questionable business <laughs> tactic, but it does happen, and you got to compete with that. That's correct. And, yes. And I, I feel like in the end, the person who gets penalized is the client because they were sold something at a price that's not achievable, and then you have to you have to reset but their expectations. Are they kind of somewhat complicit in that, though, and that they should realize that, like, hey, if everybody comes in at this rate and somebody comes in at half the rate, like, the red flag should be going off in the clients when I'm sure. saying, like, uh, are you sure? That's correct. Um, so I'm having my condo remodeled. Yep. And so now there's a bit of a role reversal. The, the folks who are working on my condo, they're the consultants and I'm the client. Um, it, it's a lot of work to put together a statement of work and then to send it out to multiple consultants and then do a side-by-side -side comparison. So I think that oftentimes that's part of the reason why um, clients will oftentimes go to just one person or maybe two because it takes work to multi-bid it out. Uh, I got another problem with yeah, uh, sure. fixed price though too that I've run into, and that is, there's no clear quality line. Uh huh. So when you sell somebody, you sell you, know, I want to buy this software product. Okay, great. You have two people bid it. Well, like they're different bids, but they're different levels of quality, and there's no easy way as right. the client to tell that. And maybe the low level quality is fine, right? If it's like a one off thing, but if it's something you're going to maintain for 20 years, that's it's right. Probably worth it paying for the the higher quality and and I love so, it. 
and, and, and we go to the notion of what does quality mean? Well, there is that too. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very subjective word. Correct. And there's a couple of dimensions. I think it's, there's the, what the code does. I'll never look at the code itself. So does it perform what it needs to, uh, does it meet requirements? Great. Then there's, uh, quality and maintainability. Yeah. And how easy can I change those? How easily can I need to, uh, I love it. Yeah. How easily can we adapt the software to changing requirements? Because by the way, they will change. Will change. Yeah, even if your requirements don't change, like the underlying operating system goes obsolete right. or hardware goes obsolete or something breaks and like, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So when we're considering quality, there's all kinds of dimensions to consider there. How long is the code going to exist? Maybe it's only going to be used for six months. That's fine. If it needs to live for 10 years or 20 years, the operating system is going to shift out from under. Yep. Technology is going to change. The code has to be adaptable. Oh, so that's all fixed price. Then yes. you get into time and expenses, which I think is what we as our consultants re really enjoy. And that's the hourly rate. But I think the biggest advantage to a client, it means that we can dream together. They don't have to tell us everything up front that they need. They just need enough for us to get started and then give them a proof of concept. And then we don't have to worry about finding the right words or the right graphic to convey the information to the consultant to get exactly what we need. The consultant gives you a proof of concept or, God willing, functioning code that you can start using immediately. And then uh, we start tacking on features like, can you add a button over here? This is why I love the agile development process as much as I do. So thumbs up, it, uh, it allows for deferred option selection where those options become more clear as time progresses mm -hmm. versus trying to figure out all the options up front. You don't have the clarity you need. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So we defer. The disadvantage is when when is this thing done and how much is this going to cost? And what I always like uh, telling my clients is um, we, we work in small little increments. We're done when you say we're done. Yep. So we work at your um, at your pleasure. Always giving you functioning code. So, so what you're talking about sounds very similar to how we work and I'll explain that in a minute. But uh... The one thing I've noticed with the two things I've noticed with the hourly pricing. One is there's the incentives aren't aligned. The longer it takes me to write the code, the more money I make versus they want to try to be as efficient as possible, right? For and sure. I mean, as consultants, like, right, that's like our own integrity that we don't do that. But there are people out there who do do that for sure. Um, that's one problem. The other problem is comparing stuff, right? Like I go to hire two consultants. One charges, I don't know, 250 an hour. One charges 200. Which one's better? That's right. Well, which one, right? Like, how do you judge that? How do you compare consultants? Yeah. That's a whole entire other science unto itself. The answer is just choose DMC. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's a great question. As somebody, when I was selecting folks for remodeling, there's tons of people in Austin. Yeah. I had to come up with some, with some criteria. And here's, here's one that I would suggest, uh, regardless of what type of consultant, be it software, engineering, business, remote, whatever it is, communication. Do they propose a plan? Do they have a means of tracking change? And do they demonstrate accountability, reliability, and traceability? And that, the demonstration of those things needs to happen at the sales phase. Um, I'm using an acronym um, internally at DMC. We call it Artful Engineering. Accountable, reliable, traceable. Uh, part of our sales process is to uh, share with the client how we operate so that we help them understand you're going to get what you need. And that's the biggest concern I found with what I was redoing like my contact. It's, after all this money, am I going to get what I need? And how do I know it? As a consultant, I will say that is probably the best sales process is to just explain your own internal process. Absolutely. To the customer and make sure the expectations are clear on both sides, right? Correct. So they know what you're expecting from them. Like if you're working in an agile way and you expect them to show up every week for meetings, yep. tell them up front, be like, you're going to have to send somebody to this meeting every week, right? So they're not surprised. Yep. Yeah. Huge red flag for me. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I like the confidence, but what, what's the plan? What's the process look like? Well, um, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Deferred decisions of that magnitude—it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but it's a red flag yeah. to me. Whereas, if we say something, like, one of the things that we use at DMC, uh, we have an entire conversation tracking system. Tons of emails go back and forth between the consultant and the client all the time. How do we make sure that we identify action items and then close those action items? If you use email chains, it's, it can be devastating because multiple action items can get uh, 
introduced in the same email chain. And then what, how do we know when a particular action get, gets closed out? Uh, internally at DMC, we use monday.com. Uh, we've developed something we call the Shared Task Action Coordination Board, or STAC. And so every question, every task, every line item gets an owner, both internally at DMC and from the, uh, from the client. And we say, what's the action that needs to take place? What's the conversation around that single thing? And what does done look like? Now, we keep track of progress on all of these different items so that we can be accountable to the client. And we know that we're doing a good job because here's the proof, here's the evidence, as opposed to information just getting lost in the email ether. That's sort of, that's just a part of the process. That's one of uh, tons of processes. So I love what you said. I think that you look for client or for, uh, for consultants who have good processes that give you reasonable confidence that the end result and the journey yeah. is going to be a good one. Yeah, I think part of that too is uh, uh, managing risk as the project goes along. And I think, you know, you talked about doing things iteratively and I think that's a great way to manage risk. That's what we do, right? So if you're doing things iteratively, like part of it depends on how you price things. So like we talked about the pricing thing. So what I what I do, I learned this from John McBee. I don't actually charge for any number of hours. I charge for like two weeks at a time. I charge an iteration. Uh, but like, so I asked me, okay, it's going to take, I don't know, four months for this project, right? Halfway through, I'm meeting with them every week and talking to them. If halfway through, we realize like this project is just not going to work for whatever reason, like technically it's just not possible. Let's just cancel the project right there. Like mm -hmm. that's the risk management side of like, you're not, because if you like, say you hire somebody, a consultant, and they disappear for four months and come back and say it doesn't work. Well, you just spent four months worth of time, right? That's right. You've lost all that time and money when you could have cut it off shorter. This is the advantage to continuous delivery and evaluation. Yeah. Delivery and evaluation. Well, and the other thing is too, if you do that with prioritization, you make sure that the most important things get done first. Key. Uh, and then if you run out of time or budget or whatever, or money, like you've got the most important things done. The rest is all nice to have stuff. And if we make a decision at that point, do we spend more money on it or not? Love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah. Continuous revisiting of prioritization, which means having your end users in mind what they need, who the who all the stakeholders yeah. are. Yeah, that's good stuff. And, and communicate with them regularly too, right? Like in getting feedback from them. Love it. Cadence of communication, clarity in communication, methodology in communication. Communication is absolutely key. And I almost feel like that, that's a, a, a skill that is becoming more rare. We'll just say that. Uh, I wish that there was a larger emphasis on communication and engineering. That's one of the things I'm going to be talking about in my presentation tomorrow, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. Give us a quick preview of your. All right. Is this similar to the presentation that I've seen a while ago at I uh, at an oh, LTLA summit? Okay. Glad you said that. All right. So, background for folks who haven't got the chance to see this. Four years ago, I think it was four years ago, maybe five years ago now. Uh, it's, yeah, it's right. been a little while. CLA summit. I gave a presentation titled "Everything a Software Developer Needs to Know That Has Nothing to Do with Software Development." The thesis statement is, um, the most important currency that you will trade in at in your organization is trust. You have to identify who to gain trust with and how to gain that trust. If people don't trust you, you will not be able to affect change. If you can't affect change, you're stuck. You're in an environment that is static and is controlling your life. Ah, oh, that's no fun. So how do you go about causing change? And with whom do you cause change? This is, go watch it, it's great. Um, yeah, it's on YouTube or it's something. YouTube. Okay. Uh, Lab View Wiki probably has a link. There is. Yeah. And if you Google my last name, uh, C I L I N O, and then everything, yeah, it'll it'll bring okay. you right to it. Real quick, the four audiences that you need to gain trust with, at least the first, most important, and most often overlooked, is yourself. You have to be able to trust that you can do the job. Now, how do you go about gaining that trust? We talk about that. Then there's trust with your coworkers, trust with your boss, trust with upper management. Mm -hmm. So I've got some tactics on how you gain trust mm -hmm. and some warnings on how you lose trust. And if you don't have trust, you don't have anything. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm trying to instill in the folks at DMC is fill in the following blank. In business, if you don't have blank, you have nothing. And it's trust. Everything, everything, everything from business to engineering to delivery, it all centers around trust. So that's part one. Part two, it's continue, uh, It's additional lessons that I've learned, specifically with 
how do you how do you manage your career and then how do you collaborate with people so uh i'll give you my i believe statement as i've grown in my career and i've gotten older uh, i've found one thesis statement that is the fount of everything else that i do uh it's the fount of all of my philosophies i believe as scientists and engineers we can dramatically cause change in this world for incredible good from an individual to the entire world. That makes our work profoundly rewarding, profoundly rewarding. It's why I get out of bed every day. When we stop to think about, well, what kind of change does an engineer have? The internet, YouTube, video recording, audio. Uh, I, I was, I'm having my condo redone right now. I was without a toilet for five weeks. I have gained an incredible appreciation for the designer of the toilet and running water and clean running water. Engineers and scientists did that. We get to participate in there. As a corollary in the second, the only thing more rewarding than a scientist and an engineer causing change in the world is us doing it together. When we get to work together and bounce ideas off of each other and use each other's work, the rate at which we cause change and the quality of that change skyrockets. Our work then lasts. It stands the test of time. God willing, we're going to have electricity for ages to come. God willing, we're going to have clean running water and structural engineering and material science for ages to come. Our work has meaning and purpose. It's very rewarding. So I take those two things. What you do, the, the your work, and where you do it, the organization that you're at, that's Category one of lessons I've learned. And then how you work with others. That's all kinds of uh, category two. I've got four or five little quips in uh, li little philosophical statements in each of those two categories. I'll give you uh, an example of uh, one of the, the, the career ones. Um, choose where you work every day. Choose it. Unless you're financially independent, yes, you're going to have to go to work. I'm not saying choose to work. I'm saying choose where you work every day. Show up to your job because it's something that gives you joy, that you're passionate about, that you have a real sense of ownership over. If you don't, your creativity, your talent, your passion, and ultimately your time is wasted. You are not realizing your full potential. It's not rewarding, and you're going to have a hard time getting out of bed every day, I promise. Well, what are the, some of the qualities of a company that you might select. And why is it important that you choose? We'll talk about that. So that's from the career side of things. Communication. This is just another one. Here it is. Talk in diamonds. Communicate in diamonds. And here's what I mean. Start with your point. Supply data. Synthesize the data. End at your point. Engineers, oftentimes, when we start a conversation, we start with first principles. And we supply data, but we never tell the person why or where we're gonna, where we're ultimately gonna conclude. As a result, our listeners going, "Why are you telling me this? Why you t I got other things I got to do. You send me an email that's this long with your question at the very end. I'm not gonna make it there because you started with a whole bunch of details building up to the question. Start with the question. Start with the call to action. Start with whatever the solicitation is. Yeah, or even make it a suggestion. Or even make well, I do that when I when I send clients things. I never like at. Like, if I've got a question I need to answer, I said, I'm going to suggest we do this. Perfect. Here's all the data that supports this. Is this, do you agree Correct. with my assessment? I love it. Yeah. Because then you're providing them with direction. It's, you make it easy for them to say yes. And if they decide they disagree, they, they have the ability to disagree. Right. And they have all the information they need. So it's uh, suggestive. You've got recommendations. You mm -hmm. provide options, advantages, and disadvantages of each. Here's your recommendation, but here are the other options. Yeah. Here's the other options. What do you think about that? I love that. That's one of our, we have this um, uh, template in Confluence at DMC called the decision behind the designs. And it's, mm -hmm. what's the question? What are all the different options? For each option, what's the advantage and disadvantage? Which option we select and why? Yep. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like that for it too, because it's showing empathy for the person you're saying to, because they've got a whole bunch of things going on. They don't understand everything that you understand. Right? That's so, right. So you're giving them, yeah. And, you, and I lay out too, like, in the data, you lay out the pros and cons of each option, and 
Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So talking diamonds. Uh, yeah, that, this is just one of the, the aspects of collaboration because we get to do amazing things in your career and we get to do it with people. So lessons learned in career management and in working with others. Well, I think it all, in my mind, it all comes back to people. Like even when you talked about doing really cool engineering things, they we're not solving problems just to do cool technology, right? right? We're solving real human problems and we're doing it with other humans, right? Okay, so you have to run other points. It's all about their bullet points inside of careers. Know the value of your work. The value, we talk about value propositions. And how do you know a value proposition uh, when, when you see one? Here's what I suggest. The value proposition always terminates on people. It's people using your solution, whatever task they are trying to accomplish. Who, who cares about the how? Yes, it's important. I get it. But ultimately, it's people. So value propositions that are meaningful and impactful always involve a person. The analogy I'm going to use is, well, what's the value of the hammer? Okay, well, a hammer drives a nail. No, that's what it does. That's not why it's important. Well, a hammer uses transfer of momentum and conservation of momentum and Newton's principles. No, that's how it does it. Why is it important? Because it allows the person holding the hammer to create efficiently and to build structures. That's its value proposition. Well, even more to build shelter and other, right? Because it's more than just wreck. Because nobody just builds a structure to build a structure. That's right. It, it allows somebody to express their will, their intent, their purpose in building structures for whatever. For some purpose. For some, for some purpose, yeah. Build a house, a church, whatever. It's whatever. Yeah. And it terminates on people trying to do a task. Again, that's the reason why I love user stories. As a person, I need a thing so that I can Understanding the so that I can as the implementer is critical. Awesome. Absolutely. It gives a meaning and purpose. It's it's rewarding. So that point, I think we should end with that statement because that ends on people. So I think that's a great uh, ending point, Chris. So uh, I could totally continue this conversation. It's been great. Uh, I very much enjoyed talking to you. So yeah, you bet. Thank you. Absolutely. Awesome. In today's episode, there was a lot of talk about how the LabQ community comes together and helps each other figure things out. Sam, Malcolm Myers, Nancy Henson, and myself have come together to start a new conference focused on just that. The LabU Consultant Summit will be December 14th, 2023, virtually. At this summit, you'll have the opportunity to bring your questions about being a consultant, running a business, marketing, how to sell to clients, anything else you want to talk about. If you'd like to learn more about this conference or attend, find the link in our show notes. Thanks. That's it for today's episode of the LabU Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabuexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment.